13th century. In Venice, young Marco Polo is about to embark on a voyage to China. However, to this day, doubts persist as to whether he ever arrived there. The sheer scale of his adventures continues to defy belief. His account becomes the bestseller of the late Middle Ages. Today, scholars the world over are seeking facts and answers. Is there reliable proof of Marco Polo's presence at the Imperial Court of China? They are searching for clues. In Marco Polo's own words, in Chinese sources, and by applying state-of-the-art technology. Even on his deathbed, Marco Polo maintains that he has told only half of all he had seen. Otherwise, he says, no one would have believed him. In 1298, in the course of a naval war between the republics of Genoa and Venice, Marco Polo, a Venetian merchant, ends up a captive prisoner in a Genovese jail. There he encounters one Rusticello of Pisa, a prolific author of chivalric novels. An imaginative writer and a well-traveled man, imprisoned and cut off from the outside world. A chance encounter with fateful consequences. Marco Polo entertains his fellow prisoner with tales of an arduous journey to faraway kingdoms. He tells of strange customs, immense riches, and of a highly civilized culture of most wondrous achievements. Rusticello is fascinated by this exotic panorama. He becomes an instant admirer of his cellmate, this man who claims to have seen all this in person. In their Genovese jail, the two men put the tale of these travels to paper. They will make Marco Polo a household name to this day. But what if these tales are all woven from hearsay? We meet Frances Wood of the British Library in London. In her book, Did Marco Polo Go to China? She questions the myth of the Venetian traveler. I think I would believe that he probably didn't travel much further than Constantinople, where we know that a Polo family had business and so on. And there, it would have, that's a great sort of entrepot where he would have met many other people who had traveled further. This would make Marco Polo a plagiarist. But does this verdict hold? Those who are convinced that the Venetian did in fact reach China have a strong argument in support of their views. What speaks in his favor is the simple fact that his descriptions of all manner of things are very precise and that most of his observations can be confirmed by Chinese sources. The dispute surrounding Marco Polo has continued unabated for centuries. When he returned after 24 years, his tales strained the belief of even those among his contemporaries who readily believed in miracles. They call him Il Milione, the braggart, a mere teller of tall tales. And to this day, the place where Marco Polo's house is said to have stood is called Corte Milione, the braggart's court. Literary scholar Marina Münkler is about to search the Venetian archives, hoping to get nearer the truth. In her view... Doubts about Marco Polo ever having been to China are based largely on the magnitude of his descriptions, which makes it hard to imagine that one man alone could have seen all that. In Marco Polo's times, Venice had amassed great wealth as the western terminus for goods from Central and Eastern Asia. Ornamentations on the Palazzi of Venice still bear witness to the interaction with the Muslim world. But in terms of fame, none of its merchants ever got close to that of Marco Polo. Of the man himself, we know very little. But at least the date of his departure seems reasonably well established. He was a rather green young man of 17 when his father and his uncle allowed him along on a voyage to Eastern Asia. 
The youngster very likely felt as though he were embarking on an adventure to the end of the earth. For Niccolo Polo and his brother Maffeo, however, this is not a venture into the unknown. Years earlier, they had penetrated deep into the heart of Mongolia and had reached the court of the mighty Kublai Khan. As merchants, they had been among the first foreigners to cross the empire of the dreaded apocalyptic horsemen. They are aware of the dangers in store. The Mongols, also known as Tatars at the time, were notorious for their cruelty, and people in the West regarded them as harbingers of doom. Under Genghis Khan and his successors, they even forayed well into Europe. Their bloody campaigns forged a Mongol empire that stretched from China in the east to the Black Sea in the west. Entire peoples were subjugated or annihilated in the course of these tumultuous events. Marco Polo relates that, after a long journey, his father and his uncle reached the court of Kublai Khan in Chengdu. There, according to his account, things took an unexpected turn. The fearsome Mongol ruler had expressed a genuine interest in Christian religion and sent the Venetians home to return with a hundred learned priests. To ensure their safe passage, the Khan had allegedly provided them with a set of so-called courier tablets. Prior to their departure, Marco's father, Niccolo Polo, shows one such golden tablet to Marco. Niccolo Polo tells his son how he and his brother Maffeo time and again had made use of it on their long journey home. In his travels, Marco Polo gives a detailed description of these tablets and quotes their inscription. By the power and grace of the great God and by the grace he vouchsafes on our empire, the name of the Khan be blessed and let all such as disobey suffer death and utter destruction. So the bearer of such a tablet was treated as a personal courier or ambassador of the Grand Khan, traveling under his official protection. The Mongols called this passport a paitsa. For the Polos, it would have been a priceless possession. But what became of their set? Venetian state archives may hold a first clue. A document from the Polo files, dated 1310, does indeed mention the courier tablets of the Grand Khan. In his testament, Marco's uncle, Maffeo, bequeathed to his nephew half a gemstone and three golden tablets, manifestly stating that they had once belonged to the Grand Khan of the Tartars. Yet a further document confirms the existence of the tablets the dowry list of Marco Polo's daughter, Fantina. We know that this kind of golden tablet served as ambassadorial passport within the Khan Empire, meaning they did exist. Why else would they be mentioned in a testament or a dowry list? Spring 1271. For the first leg of their voyage, the Polos board a crusader ship bound for the Holy Land. Its destination, the port of Accra. Here they met, as Marco would later claim, the newly elected Pope, Gregory X. Marco tells Rustichello that the head of the church had supplied them with everything they would need to accomplish their mission. A letter of recommendation addressed to the Grand Khan and permission to present him with a few drops of oil from the lamp said to have burned above the grave of Christ. However, concerning the 100 priests requested by the Khan, there would be only two monks to accompany them. A 14th century manuscript highlights the importance of their mission and the issuing of the papal order. But did all this really happen? There isn't a pope at the time, and they cross with someone who might, who then does become pope. But of course, as you said, there's no proof of any of this. There's no record, and the Vatican is full of letters to and from Mongol leaders, um, but nothing which seems to fit with the Polos. But I think it, it is part of the question of, of self-presentation, that um, 
they rather kind of, they make themselves grander. But seemingly, the story is not garnered from thin air. Marco Polo even provides the names of the two monks. And there is another source which confirms that a certain William of Tripolis lived in Palestine at that time, a monk who was fluent in Arabic and who had comprehensive knowledge of Oriental matters. In other words, an ideal choice for the venture at hand. The travelers set out for Armenia, where they find themselves in the midst of a local war. Fearing for their lives, the monks turn back. The Polos, however, continue their journey, facing 8,000 kilometers of danger and hardship along the Silk Road to the court of Kublai Khan. They have been traveling for months now. The nearer they get to China, the more intimidating everything around them becomes. Granted, there is the Pax Mongolica, a kind of official protection for merchants. But what is this worth out here? Bandits regularly prey on caravans plying the trade routes, attacking and plundering. The constant pervasive threat produces an atmosphere both sinister and uncanny. But there are also moments of sheer magic and amazement, yet they always intermingle with fear spawned by the gruesome legends told and retold around flickering campfires. Two and a half decades later, Marco Polo was to relate them in his sober, matter-of-fact style, often almost impassively. He tells of bandits who would call upon the devil to darken the skies, only to emerge from a cloud of black dust, charging side by side against traders or merchants too poorly armed to mount forceful resistance, who would be plundered and often killed. But then, Rustichello as narrator steps in. It seems as though his professional sense of drama repeatedly places Marco Polo in the midst of the action, making it difficult to decide where a mere account ends and where Rustichello's imagination takes over. At the end of this particular episode, his hero manages to escape. All others are either slain or enslaved. Rustichello does expressly speak of our book as though they were co-authors, which in a way they actually were. There are many passages in the travels where Marco Polo figures as a kind of presenter, but he in turn is presented by Rustichello. So without Rustichello, Marco Polo would be practically non-existent in the book. As a traveler, Marco Polo was far from unique. Scholars have listed at least 33 men who, in the 13th century, had set forth to China before him. But his report dwarfs all others by the wealth of its details. In 1253, a Franciscan friar, William of Rubruck, had set out from Constantinople for Central Asia and the Empire of the Mongols. He left a vivid description of his impressions. To be the first among Tatars was as if I had entered a new world. On one occasion, literally hordes of barbarians came galloping towards us. Afterwards, I really thought that we'd escaped the devil by a mere hair's breadth. Rubruk definitely portrays himself as the colorful hero of his own story. With Marco Polo, there is always the impression of a remote collector of facts, which is paradoxically what later caused skeptics to doubt his veracity. I don't think the data-oriented exposition in Marco Polo's book can be taken as a clue that he was not there in person. I rather think that he refrained from putting forth his personal experiences because he was striving for objectivity. I don't see this as an attempt to conceal that he had merely worked with excerpts from other sources. Most of the facts in his account can be verified, and there's no other European source from this era which provides us with more data.
For instance, how many days does it take to cross a particular desert? Where do you find food, water, adequate lodgings? Pick up The Travels of Marco Polo and you'll easily find a practical answer. Its author has an eye for even the tiniest detail. For travellers from the West, he writes, the Taklamakan, so hostile to life, is the last great obstacle to the Middle Kingdom. If you try to cross it from one end to the other, he tells Rusticello, the journey would take a whole year. Only by navigating the narrowest stretch could a traveller on horseback manage the crossing in about 30 days. And he tells Rusticello of wondrous sounds rising at night like the voices of spirits, filling the air with strange music, reminiscent of drum rolls that drive travellers almost out of their minds. It was, Marco says, as if the spirits were calling his name, and often they had lured travellers into the desert, misguiding them to become lost forever. The Singing Dunes. In China, they call them Mingsha Shan. When the wind raises millions of grains of sand and whirls them about, it creates a disturbing, sonorous effect. A fascinating spectacle of nature. To the people of Marco Polo's times, it must have sounded like melodies from another world. At the western end of the Taklamakan, the Silk Road divides. The Polos follow the southern route. Thirty days later, they reach Dunhuang, an oasis, as well as an important city. In his account, however, Marco Polo barely mentions it. This is the hub of several trade routes and the gateway to China proper. Nearby are the Buddha caves of Dunhuang, a mysterious site from where Buddhism once spread to the Middle Kingdom. Along the Silk Road from India, the new faith was carried over thousands of kilometers eastward. Monks had carved hundreds of caves into the sandstone as places of worship and adorned them with innumerable paintings and statues to honor the founder of their religion. So why, Francis Wood wonders, does Marco Polo seem almost unaware of the magnificence of the place? Dunhuang is, is world famous. It's this an, an amazing site in the desert, this wonderful long cliff, which has got about 700 little caves carved into it. It's the most dramatic site. Now, he just mentions the name of the place and then talks about some Muslim customs. Not a word about the cliff, the Buddhas, anything like that, um, which does seem to suggest that it might not have been a, a personal visit. Up to this point, Marco Polo's descriptions of places and cities are in line with the caravan trail to Dunhuang. But then there's a leap in his narrative as though he had strayed from the plausible route. Here he makes us another sudden sally northwards, rather pointlessly to Karakoto. Now, I mean, this is a very kind of mysterious move because Karakoto was the capital of the Tanguts. The Tanguts had been wiped off the map in 1227. So why anyone would go there is difficult to understand. Then he comes back on to Dunhuang. And there's another vexing detail in the pages that follow. Why is there not a single line about China's Great Wall, which stretches along the Silk Road once you leave Dunhuang? If you come uh, going along the Gansu Corridor, you have flat plain between mountains and then this great yellow wall in the middle. It's, it's unmissable and it's the most dramatic sight. You would have certainly wondered what on earth it was, but um, there is no mention of it. This is one of the most imposing structures ever built. For more than 2,000 years, China's rulers ordered their subjects to construct and renew this gigantic line of defense. At first, they used clay, rebuilding long stretches with massive stone bit by bit in later years. That Marco Polo should have overlooked it entirely seems rather improbable to a modern mind. But then, there are other contemporary travel accounts that fail to mention the wall with a single word. Even the first proper map, charted in 1385 and covering the whole of China, does not record it. 
The Great Wall of China, a complete blank. This 16th century map is the first ever to outline the Great Wall in its course. So Marco Polo did not overlook the gigantic wall of stone as we know it today. In his time, it was a derelict line of crumbled clay, which, after centuries of neglect, had long lost any meaning to the people who lived nearby. 300 years would pass before work resumed on the Great Wall. The question, why his account more or less skips the sights of Dunhuang, however, remains unanswered. The Polos have finally reached China, yet there are still 2,000 kilometers ahead before they reach their destination, the court of Kublai Khan in Chengdu. By then, the Grand Khan had proclaimed himself the first Mongol emperor of China. In a series of hard-fought campaigns, the grandson of Genghis Khan had succeeded in subduing all opposing Mongol tribes. For the first time in 300 years, the empire is once again united under a single ruler. Kublai Khan becomes the founder of the Yuan dynasty. He is the most powerful man on earth. Rusticello writes, asserting he would always adhere to the truth, that when the Venetians arrived, the Khan had called for a magnificent welcoming spectacle and ordered the entire court to participate. This, Rusticello continues, was regarded as an exceptional honor for the Polos. Three years after leaving Venice, they have finally reached their destination, an all-important moment, one would suppose. But Marco, now in his 20th year, omits to relate a single personal impression of his first face-to-face -face encounter with the Emperor of China. Whatever he might have felt or thought, he kept to himself. His story is the stuff of epics, and film producers readily pounced on it. Numerous stars have portrayed Marco Polo as a dashing hero, an adventurer who overcomes any danger, gains the friendship of the emperor, and returns home laden with riches. But in his account, Marco Polo declines to seek center stage. For him, the true hero of his tale is the great Kublai Khan. According to Marco, on New Year's Day, more than 100,000 magnificent white horses were presented to the ruler, an incredible number that makes even the loyal Rusticello doubt his cellmate's sincerity. But Marco's admiration for the Khan is boundless. To him, he is a ruler who defies comparison, be it in terms of power or of wealth. Each year, on the 28th of September, Marco says, the Khan would celebrate the date of his birth by donning garments covered entirely with small plaques of gold. In attendance were 12,000 nobles and knights from throughout the realm, wearing gowns to match those of the emperor in fashion and color, displaying belts of gold indicating their rank. Some of these garments, Marco insists, were embroidered with gemstones and pearls worth more than 10,000 Byzantine florins. Marco Polo offers a very detailed description of the Khan for whom he has a near sacred reverence. We read of festivities, of ceremonies, of imperial hunts. And he dedicates long paragraphs to dress regulations, the bestowing of belts and the significance of certain brocade garments. All this is confirmed by Chinese sources. Since the 19th century, scholars have scrutinized ancient Chinese documents for traces of Marco Polo. But there is only one name which bears a phonetic similarity to the Venetian surname, Boluo. This attribution, Boluo equals Polo, is still in dispute. But in 2010, Chinese historian Pang Hai struck upon something that might substantiate the identification of Boluo with Marco Polo. Pang Hai had dug deeply into the Yuan She the chronicles of the Yuan dynasty. The Yuan Shi relates that a certain Saman, a confidant of the Khan, had issued a warrant ordering the arrest of another young courtier named Boluo, 
the charge, Boloo had violated the standing order that within the Imperial Palace, women and men must walk separately. When the Grand Khan hears of the arrest, he orders Boloo to be brought before him. Having heard his case, the Khan not only pardons Boloo, he even entrusts him with an important mission and sends him away to a distant province. Once there, Boloo shall act as the Khan's official collector of taxes. The Khan held a protective hand over Marco Polo. Saman felt deeply humiliated. He turned to alcohol and soon died an embittered man. His death caused considerable discontent among high officials. Marco Polo's standing at court and even his life were endangered. This was the reason why the wise Khan had sent him to a distant province and out of harm's way. In Marco Polo's account, we read nothing about the arrest of its protagonist. The corresponding passage merely mentions the courtier's general envy and a mission to a remote corner of the empire. By checking the place names of the itinerary, historians have concluded that in 1282, Marco Polo's destination must have been Yangzhou. When we retrace his stages on the route to Yangzhou, it becomes obvious that Marco Polo must have used the post road. This indicates travel on horseback, a privilege reserved for high-ranking officials, which, in turn, reveals that he must have held a corresponding title. Yangzhou is situated on the banks of the Grand Canal of China, or the Emperor's Canal, as it was called in Marco Polo's time. Back then, being the hub of the salt trade, Yangzhou had grown into one of the wealthiest cities of the empire. According to Marco Polo's own words, he spent three years in Yangzhou. At the foot of the Venetian statue, Hans Ulrich Vogel meets historian Pang Hai, a native of Yangzhou. He has been searching for proof of Marco Polo's stay in his hometown. Sifting through documents concerning administrative affairs in medieval China, Pang Hai has uncovered a number of striking similarities. For him, there is no doubt that Marco Polo held a high official post in Yangzhou's tax and salt authority. No one before had ever listed the 27 districts of the Yangzhou province as precisely and correctly as he did. Chinese sources confirm that this administrative division was in practice for three years only, exactly matching the time span Marco Polo claims to have spent in the region. But could he really have held such an exalted position? As a matter of fact, a European in the service of Kublai Khan was no exception. China's ruler is known to have drawn on foreign experts, most of whom remain nameless and have left few traces. And there is one irrefutable proof that there were, in fact, quite a number of them. In 1951, excavations in Yangzhou unearthed a set of gravestones bearing Christian symbols. In the 15th century, they had been reused as building material to construct the new city wall. On one gravestone, archaeologists discovered the name of a child, Katerina Ilioni, who had died here in Yangzhou in the year of our Lord, 1342. Her family hailed from Upper Italy, as did Marco Polo. The inscription tells us that Caterina was the daughter of one Domenico Iglioni, a merchant from Genoa. Clearly, Iglioni had somehow settled in Yangzhou and was conducting business. This shows that in certain regions, it was conceivable to encounter an Italian engaged in trade with the Chinese. From foreign merchant to state official, 
in the service of the powerful Salt Authority, a leap that is all the more credible as Marco Polo reveals intimate knowledge of its workings. To this day, scholars are amazed at the Venetians' detailed description of the salt-making process. In Xiangshan, 200 kilometers from the former seat of the Imperial Salt Authority, they still produce large amounts of China's white gold by exposing seawater to the sun. But there are hints that somewhere in the region, another, even older technique of producing salt is still in use, a technique mentioned by Marco Polo. Tips from the locals point Hans Ulrich Vogel towards Dashu, the village of the salt men. Until quite recently, a salt man's workday began with a prayer in the temple. Zhang Bo was one of them. Every morning, they would perform the traditional ritual to ask the gods for their blessing before beginning their day's work. <laughs> Zhang Bo tells of their prayers and how, to his regret, the times have changed so much that the salt output of the village has dwindled to a near standstill. Most of the old simmering equipment has been scrapped. Zhu Shang Hao, the salt god, may have outlived his usefulness, but is still accorded a daily bowl of fruit in time-honored reverence and to invoke his protection over the village. Marco Polo is familiar with all this. He describes in detail the leaching process, exactly as it is still practiced by the salt men of Dashu. Salt is leached from mineral-bearing soils by adding water. When the concentration of a solution is high enough, it is poured into large pans and boiled until the salt particles crystallize. Just the way Marco Polo described it more than 700 years ago. The annual salt tax from a single district, he says, was worth almost six million sagi in gold, around 27 tons by today's standard. The data that Marco Polo has left us concerning the Imperial Salt Authority is surprisingly detailed, precise, comprehensive and systematically chronicled. When we compare this with Chinese sources, we find that it corresponds almost 100%. And the most amazing fact is that these sources date from an era long after Marco Polo's time, so he could not have made use of them for his account. He must have had an insider's knowledge, meaning he saw all this with his own eyes. As a tax official, and as the ever-curious wanderer between two worlds, Marco Polo experiences the China of the Grand Khan as a country replete with a spirit of revival and invigoration. Wherever he goes, new buildings are under construction. Old ones are being enlarged or renovated. The Venetian is awed by the achievements of Kublai Khan, he sees a highly civilized state with an administration honed to perfection and a road system unrivaled anywhere else. Time and again, scholars stumble upon seemingly marginal details in his account. On either side of public roads, wherever possible, the Khan demands that trees be planted three paces apart, that they may serve to indicate the road surface when covered with winter snow and to afford summer shade to travelers and their horses. Observations like these leave little doubt that their author had first-hand knowledge of such matters. While scrutinizing documents of the Yuan Dynasty's postal system, historian Dang Bao Hai has found three sources that confirm the details related by Marco Polo. They expressly state that Kublai Khan was the first ruler to order the planting of trees along the post roads. Many foreign travelers were abroad throughout the Yuan Empire, but it is only with Marco Polo that we find the kind of marginal details and footnotes that match historical documents. The Imperial Palace in today's Beijing, built along the lines of its predecessor from the times of Kublai Khan. Back then, the ruler ordered an entire city to be built from scratch as a symbol of his power and in 1264 made it his new main residence. To Marco Polo, its checkerboard layout is a masterpiece of town planning and a most magnificent sight to behold. 
Adorned with paintings, marble, silver and gold, the likes of which Europe has never seen, he is enraptured. To control his vast empire, the Grand Khan must rely on dispatches from his roaming officials. These he sends on countless missions to report on anything that might have a bearing on the affairs of state. It is on his tours of inspection that Marco Polo memorizes his huge wealth of details, thus becoming one of the foremost authorities on what, back then, was modern China. The hinterland of Khan Balik, the Khan's city, as Beijing was then called, would comprise 200 individual cities, he relates. From there, people flock to the capital and bring their produce and merchandise. No fewer than a thousand carriages and pack horses loaded with raw silk arrive daily. It appears that Marco Polo had developed a passion for China's imposing stone bridges. In his account, the Lugo Chao Bridge in Beijing takes pride of place. Back then, it was 16 kilometers from there into the capital. The river spanned by the bridge would take merchants and their goods all the way to the sea. In the 17th century, a flood wreaked havoc with the Lugo Chao. It had to be rebuilt. But the measurements Marco Polo quotes still apply. 300 paces long and eight paces wide. There's no other bridge in the world like it, he would tell Rusticello. We still find construction elements from Marco Polo's time. For instance, these parapets, which he describes in great detail. He talks of stone pillars, each one topped by the statue of a lion. Between the columns are horizontal stone slabs, he explicitly states, that prevent people from falling into the river. Marco Polo, it may be important to add, is the only non-Chinese author who left such an elaborate description of this particular bridge. In the harbour of Chuenchou, Marco Polo makes special note of the unusual construction of the pylons of the local bridge. Both ends are tapered, like the bow of a ship, facing upstream and downstream, because, he writes, at very high tides, there is upstream flooding from the sea to the interior. Scholars say only someone actually present would be interested in information such as this. To the Venetian, the empire of the Mongols is a land of wonders, one being paper money, still unheard of in Europe. With a piece of paper such as this, Marco tells Rustichello, he had bought goods everywhere without the slightest problem. The Mongols produced it from the bark of mulberry trees. And he adds that anyone refusing to accept such a paper as legal tender is liable to face the death penalty. As a specialist in medieval Chinese finance, Hans Ulrich Vogel knows the contemporary sources referring to paper money. Some 20 years before Marco Polo, a monk compared its texture to cotton. Marco Polo again provides an additional detail. He describes the process used to produce the paper for their currency using mulberry fiber. Frankfurt, Germany. Lab experts at Goethe University have been asked to examine a priceless specimen of Chinese paper money issued in the 14th century to ascertain its basic raw material. Since the monetary system of the Yuan dynasty had worked so well, it was adopted by its successors more or less unchanged. It is the first time a detail from Marco Polo's account is subjected to scientific scrutiny. Will he be faulted on his claim that the Chinese used the membrane between the bark and the wood of the mulberry tree? A tiny sample, 1.5 millimeters thick, almost invisible to the eye, is removed from one edge of the note and prepared for analysis. The result is conclusive. The membrane shows an irregular structure and permits light to pass through unevenly, a defining feature 
of mulberry fiber. So, can it really be that Marco Polo might have lifted all this from other sources or assembled it from hearsay, as skeptics continue to assert? He goes on to state the size and the street value of particular notes, their equivalent in gold, of a 3% surtax for exchanging withered notes, and he mentions inflation. Scholars have put his data to the test, comparing them with information from eight other sources. Marco Polo has dedicated an entire chapter to China's paper money, and if we analyze its content against what other Western, Arabian and Persian authors have written, we see at first glance that it was Marco Polo who gave the most detailed, precise and comprehensive data about old paper money that has ever reached us. Marco Polo experiences China as a modern country, a land of prosperity. Details about local peculiarities and mundane curiosities are as noteworthy to him as the consummate organization of the vast empire. However, the wealth of details in his account are oddly counterbalanced by much of what he omits. For instance, there is not a single line about printing, then still unknown in Europe, nor of Chinese script, the curious custom of binding the feet of noble women or the ceremonial ritual of preparing tea. Such omissions still divide scholars into believers and detractors. Yet even Frances Wood, although she remains skeptical that Marco Polo ever did go to China, acknowledges the importance of his account. The good side about the whole controversy is that it does allow people to carry on working, looking, looking in different ways and looking at medieval the medieval world, and that it's really provoked a lot of study, which is great. And I think what is important is that Marco Polo's book really brought China to Europe. And really, that's all I've ever wanted to do in, in this book and any other, is to bring China to Europe so that people can understand it better. In Marco Polo's day, not only faraway China is a blank spot on the map of his European contemporaries, next to nothing is known about the countries east of Persia. Marco Polo is the first who endeavors to fill the gap. No one before has traveled so widely, seen so much, and brought back stories that often border on the bizarre. Marco. One day in jail, he confides a tale from the province of Tibet. He describes a most curious custom the locals would transact with traveling merchants. Initially, even trusty Rustichello is reluctant to believe this story. Under no circumstances would a Tibetan man marry a virgin. According to Marco, a girl was obliged to have had sexual intercourse with a number of men, lest she be regarded as worthless. Therefore, Tibetan mothers would approach men of passing caravans to sleep with their daughters, assuring obliging men they could enjoy the tryst as long as they wished. All that was expected in return was a modest trinket which, strung up and worn as a necklace, would testify to the girl's amorous skills. In the eyes of Tibetans, the girl with the most trinkets would make the most desirable bride and be blessed by the gods. This rather frivolous tale has been credited to the fertile imagination of Rustichello, who lets the episode end on that note. In some versions of the travels, however, it is missing altogether. There are about 150 versions of the original manuscript. Some vary greatly in their content, as well as in their wording. For instance, in the Latin translation by Pipino da Bologna, a Dominican monk, the premarital custom is viewed very differently. In Pipino's words, it is a despicable habit that originated from idolatry. Pipino certainly altered many aspects of the text to accord with the mores of his Dominican order. He intervened with the basic structure of the account and edited a number of passages, such as the one about the so-called Tibetan guest prostitution. In the Franco-Italian version, this passage is told with an unmistakable wink of the eye. 
Whereas Peppino adds a commentary stating that this custom was utterly abhorrent. So Pius Peppino adapted the text to suit his Christian morals. Marco Polo, too, is a man of the late Middle Ages and their prevailing beliefs. But his account shows him to be surprisingly open-minded and ever curious. His attitude towards Buddhism, for example, is one of explicit tolerance, and he admires the policy of Kublai Khan, who had elevated the teachings of Buddha to be the prominent faith in his empire, whilst tolerating the worshipping of other gods. Marco remains a faithful Christian, enjoying the Khan's individual protection, but finally he senses that the time has come to depart. The Grand Khan is now an old man, and since no one could predict which turn events might take after his passing, Marco's father and his uncle strongly argue for their departure. This coincides with the arrival of three barons from the far west of the empire who had arrived to ask the Khan to send a princess as a bride for their ruler, Argun. Their names, as Marco relates them, were Olatai, Apuska and Koya. He tells Rustichello the Khan had chosen young Princess Kokachin and asked the Venetians to escort her on a ship's passage to Persia, and thus began their return journey home. So, is the story of the bridal escort the final touchstone of Marco Polo's credibility? It was only in 1913 that his account was translated into Chinese. Since then, Chinese historians have scrutinized the archives, among them the National Library in Beijing. And in a 15th century encyclopedia, they found what they had been seeking. The Yongle Dadian confirms the courtship of a Persian delegation and lists the envoy's names. They are Ulatai, Apuska, and Koya. The Yongle Ladadia may not mention the name of Marco Polo, but all the others are there. And there's also a later Persian chronicle by one Rashid al-Bin, which states the return of the delegation to Persia. So it all fits together and combines into a very plausible order of events. This shows that Marco Polo's account is consistent with the facts, and it's more clear evidence that he actually had been in China. The voyage home was to take four years. Shortly after his return, Marco Polo falls into the hands of the Genovese and, with the help of his cellmate Rustichello, begins to compose his account. Two years later, Marco is released. Rustichello, alas, vanishes from the records. Marco marries into a wealthy family and sires three daughters, but to his dying day, he is denied recognition by his contemporaries for his achievements as well as for their wondrous account. Priests urge him to renounce his fabrications. Finally, facing his death, it was time, they say, to admit that his travels were a mere concoction, invented as a bid for fame. To the Venetians, Marco Polo remains il milione, the braggart. Yet, even on his deathbed, he maintains that he has told merely half of what he had seen. Otherwise, no one would have believed him. He dies in 1324 in his 70th year. He leaves a small fortune, the account of his travels, and a sober last will and testament. It contains not even a vague reference to his adventures. Marco Polo. His name became synonymous with the quintessential traveler who returned with fascinating tales of places that hold the lure of exotic encounters and make us yearn to visit faraway countries and cultures. But he also left a work of broad horizons presenting the world of Asia to the eyes of the West. What's more, 168 years after Marco Polo's death, Christopher Columbus set sail, determined to discover the sea route to exotic Asia. On his desk in his cabin, a copy of the travels of Marco Polo filled with annotations highlighting the most promising destinations. Places where Aurum in Copia Maxima is said to be great amounts of gold. In his time, few believed Marco Polo but his account heralds the age of great European discoverers. 
To his dying day, Columbus would believe he had come ashore on some islands off mainland China in the legendary realm of the Great Khan, where, all the while, Marco Polo had actually already been there. <laughs>